today is also, uh, as you said, um, we are also commemorating the chair's long time project on this Irish, uh, on the presence of this Irish historical figure, Roger Casement in Brazil, um, which culminates, as you also said, with the Brazil, with the, um, the, 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 the documentary by Brazilian director um, Aurelio Michiles called Secrets from Putumayo, which I would like to share the trailer with all of you now. So bear with me a minute and I will show the, the trailer. <laughs> Heavy rain almost every night. I shall be in the wilderness for fully four, perhaps six months. All the region has rubber, but no labor, save its Indian tribes. The present system is not merely slavery, but extermination. The Amazon. God knows how this will end. Okay. All right, so it received um, an award in the festival, All is True, um, and though it hasn't been launched yet due to the pandemic, the documentary has been acclaimed as Michele's masterpiece and has received excellent reviews. I would like to thank historian Angus Mitchell and the, um, uh, the, the Irish actor um, here present, uh, Stephen Frey, uh, and the whole team of excellence that produced the film. Andre Finotti, Andre Lorenz Michilis, Avi Simigoto, and Patrick Leblanc, who are also here today um, sharing this session. I would also like to thank uh, filmmaker and writer Alan Gilsonen, Munira Mutran, who is also here present, and all, the, all of you who are uh, assisting us through YouTube. So I would like uh, to call Ambassador Jean Roy, who will chair the session in conversation with Angus Mitchell and Stephen Ray. Um, and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. You can hear me okay? So, good morning to everybody from Brasilia and anybody watching in Ireland, good afternoon and happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. And I'd like to associate myself with all the thanks, especially the comments from Owen around the role of the WBE as chair. I will not repeat everything, but um, it is really always very special on St. Patrick's Day to be with you. And though we can't be with you in person this year, we are certainly with you in spirit. And I have the pleasure of introducing Angus Mitchell, um, who I met on my last visit to Sao Paulo, which was two years ago, when we discussed um, casement. And Angus has edited the Amazon Diaries, and, we're, and they are the inspiration for, for this documentary. And Stephen, um, one of our uh, national heritage actors, um, our national treasures, I meant to say, um, provides a voiceover. So I think before we go into that, what I'd like to do is just take a minute or two to talk about my own my own experience with Casement, because um, I've lived in Mozambique, Nigeria and Brazil, <clears throat> as Casement did, and um, I've come across them in, in every occasion. And really, I think like a lot of Irish people, we knew about casement, but we didn't know much. And uh, my first 
uh, real experience was in 1995 when I visited the British Embassy in Maputo with two other colleagues. And this is a two-story building in Maputo. And when you visit, they bring you to a plaque at the front and said, which says, Churchill arrived here during the Boer War. He arrived on a Saturday morning and was as an escaped prisoner and was told to come back on Monday during working hours. And everybody enjoys the humour of this. And then you enter and there's a photograph of every consul and every head of mission that ever served in Mozambique and Kilimani and Santos and or uh, Kilimani and they're they're all up the wall um, like you would expect religious pictures to be in a church as it was. Um, we met with the ambassador and um, it was really a, a important week because we were deciding whether to open our embassy or not and we were consulting with those who were already there and after that one hour meeting the ambassador the british ambassador said when you chaps are here i should show you this and he opened a door behind us and into another room and there was a portrait of roger casement hanging on the wall and it was a picture i'd never seen reproduced anywhere else it was a hand-drawn picture and you know i have thought about that since and more i suppose more deeply last night and you know, this was almost 80 years after Casement was executed, but his picture had been taken down, put up again, put on shelves, but whatever, he was still there and he was still a lasting presence. And I think that's, you know, where I want to start this story. And Alan's excellent documentary, The Ghost of Roger Casement, is that he lives on and his story has to be retold and retold and reinterpreted. Um, after, after that visit, I, I bought Brian Inglis's book and I had a number of copies of it because every time I lent it to somebody, I never got it back. I now have a first edition original and I'm not lending this to anybody, but um, it's one of the, I had five books to bring with me. It would be one of them. And Angus's uh, Amazon Diaries, of course, be one of the others. Um, but when we went to Nigeria, it was in 2016, and it was the centenary of the Easter Rising, and we were encouraged to look at opportunities around the world to commemorate that. And we, did, we looked at the time that Casement spent, it was very early in his career in the Niger Protectorate, but he lived in Calabar, right down at the, um, almost on the coast, and this is where all the sea traffic came into Nigeria, and it was the first, first port of call, really. And... Um, what we discovered there was that, well, you know, there are pictures of Casement in Calabar outside an iron building. We found that building. We went there. We discovered that he produced three maps, very much in character. He went in to the interior to produce these maps without any security. And he was the only person that did that. Everybody went heavily armed. And he produced what are very unique and beautiful maps, and they're available um, to purchase. And we then framed copies of these maps and we presented them to a uh, the museum in Calabar and it was one of my last opportunities to open that. But we, we had a session on human rights in Calabar and we had the Nigerian Under Secretary General from the United Nations, Ibrahim Gambari, as our guest speaker. And we were talking about what would Casement think of Nigeria 100 years later or slightly more. And it was a fascinating discussion because there was a lot of anger in the room. They were around current issues. They were different issues, but they were about deforestation in, of the indigenous forest. They were about decisions by the government to move everybody 300 meters from the shore. But there was real anger and there was real power in that room. And I think that was the moment when I moved from a fasc fascination with casement to inspiration. And I was there with colleague Owen McSweeney, who's now in New York, and we realized that we had to do something. Rather than just commemorate, we had to actually be inspired. And um, we then set up a Roger Casement Fellowship. It was the right time to make such a suggestion to Dublin. And there's a Human Rights Fellowship, um, which we fund every year. One Nigerian goes to a university in Ireland. It's up to the those uh, applicants to find their own place. The first year we had a police officer who wanted to go and uh, do a degree on human rights and communications so that he could better represent the views of the police. 
And I think this was a very important role. But the second one was a medical doctor with polio who has his, lives with his own disabilities. And he found a course in Galway, which was about human rights and disability. And then we started to realize that human rights is much broader. And, you know, I think this program is now in its sixth year. We have Nigerians bringing their stories to Ireland, enriching our universities, sharing their experience. And, you know, I think it, it's been one of the better legacies that we've left. Um, and then, you know, we, we took the opportunity to start um, educating people, I think, about um, casement in, in Nigeria. We had our 2016 special presentation on casement and, of course, you know, my colleagues from the British Embassy and the Belgian Embassy were particularly interested because he touches on the histories of those countries. And um, from that, you know, we went back to Calabar. I met with Father Kevin O'Hara, who is one of our uh, Irish missionaries there. And Kevin is involved and still is involved very much in human rights work. And, you know, we worked together. We got a number of people off death row and a number of life sentences commuted. And, you know, I, le I lent him another copy of English's book. Um, and there's a picture I sent you earlier, Lara, of myself presenting Father Kevin with a portrait of uh, a casement, which now hangs in their mission house in Calabar. So I think, you know, when I arrived um, in Brazil, I've been fascinated in another way by how Kismet has inspired Mario Vargas Llosa to write his interpretation, uh, The Dream of the Celt, but also Aurelio's uh, masterpiece. I think, you know, this, it is very challenging to talk about something that nobody is able to see um, or able to log in and watch straight after this discussion, but it is yet another interpretation. And I tend to think that Kismet's human rights work, it lingers, it nags us. He's a wasp in our head and he doesn't allow us to settle because many of the issues are still alive. And I think what we, we see in this documentary is that the issues of indigenous people in this part of the world are not resolved. There are challenges. And I think um, as I introduce you, Stephen, you have become the voice of that wasp in my head. And I think it's very fitting because even when I was rereading Inglis's book, there was all those parts of the diary, I was hearing it with your voice. So maybe with those few words, can I, can I introduce you, Stephen, to take it from here? Thank you. Um, so can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much, Sean. Thanks for your kind words. Um, I'm, I'm going to read uh, two passages uh, that are fragments in Casement's manuscript, which is held in the National Library of Ireland. Um, and it bears out everything you've been saying about him. Um, Casement compares the deforestation of Ulster and Munster during the plantations to the deforestation of the Amazon in his own time. What you glimpse here is Casement's proto-environmentalism. His call for people to plant more trees might be a usefully adopted practice to encourage children to do so on St. Patrick's Day, which was traditionally the day when new potatoes were planted or set. So, <clears throat> In Ireland, as we know, once the land of trees, the scarcity of timber is now so great that a Royal Commission was appointed in 1907 to report upon the best means of preservation of what is left and restoration of that already destroyed. The civilized races of mankind are beginning to realize that the wood supplies of modern industrial life are reaching their limits so rapidly as to threaten peril to many existing industries and to exclude the possibility of development of new ones. The need for wood and forests that have not heard the ring of the woodman's axe or the whir of the saw wheel is as great as or greater than the need for new sources of food supply. 
Uncultivated lands the earth still has in plenty, wherein the maize and manioc, the wheat crop and the banana may yet be raised to meet an ever-expanding demand. But the untouched forested zones are now perilously few. And while a tree may be felled in a moment, it needs it may be a century to develop to any stage of useful growth. The Japanese proverb that no man may die in a sense of duty done who has not planted a tree should be translated into school books and applied in the daily lives of all Western peoples. And the second piece. From the earliest times, we find civilized man a destroyer. He slew the trees as he slew the inhabitants from motives of safety or to fulfill the designs of conquest. The Inquisition of New Spain or the Puritans of New England were equally improvident of life, whether it belonged to the vegetable or animal kingdom. The historian William Prescott tells us that in the times of the Aztecs, the Mexican tableland, today a parched, sun-soaked steppe, was thickly covered with larch, oak, cypress, and other forest trees. The extraordinary dimension of some of which remaining to the present day show that the curse of barrenness in later times is chargeable more on man than on nature. Indeed, the early Spaniards made an indiscriminate war on the forest, as did our Puritan ancestors, though with much less reason. After once conquering the country, they had no lurking ambush to fear from the submissive, semi-civilized Indian, and were not like our forefathers, obliged to keep watch and ward for a century. As the Spanish invaders of Mexico did with the forests of the Aztec Plateau, so the English invaders of Ireland did with the great woodlands of Munster and Ulster. In their case, the commercial instinct, doubtless still more primitive than religious fervor in the Spaniard, added a fierce incentive to a policy of unearthing the Irish wood kern from his lair. The great forest of Glanconcaine, which covered a wide portion of the modern counties of Tyrone and Derry, and remained down to the last days of Elizabeth, a stronghold of Irish woodcraft, was almost entirely destroyed within the next two reigns. In the days of Charles II, 60 years after the Axe of Chichester was first laid to their roots, scarce one of the mighty oaks whose name alone survives in the many forms of Derry, that is, Dedda, applied to town or hamlet remain to indicate the great forest stronghold of the O'Neills. Which is a far cry from Loch Ern to the Amazon. Now, uh, in this next reading, Case reflects on the causes of the suffering of the peaceful forest communities forced into the extra active economy. Caseman sees not merely the great suffering being borne by the local and indigenous people, but he recognizes too their resilience and agency. When I had finished with Levine, I went out to see the rubber arriving. They came up the hill, men, women and children, largely the two last, staggering under perfectly phenomenal loads. I've never seen such weights carried on roads and such roads in Africa or anywhere else. Lots of men wear boras, big fine looking fellows with broad faces, very pale skins, almost white men indeed, simply bronzed by the sun and frank open air and manner. Their bodies were slim and graceful and their bodily strength very remarkable. I tried to carry one load of rubber, made Chase lift it and put it on my shoulder, Normand standing on. I could not walk three paces with it, literally and truly. My knees gave way and to save my life, I don't think I could have gone 50 yards. 
Yet here they were coming in from eight to 10 hours away, 25 to 30 miles, and with 45 miles of that atrocious path through the forest before them to get to Puerto Peruano. And their only food, such as they could bring with them, made by their poor wives who were tottering along under loads of 50, 60, 70, and 80 pounds. The little boys, some of them five or six, without even a phono, stark naked, dear little things with soft, gentle eyes and long eyelashes were coming along too, often with 30 pounds or more on their tiny backs. I saw one lad, looked about 15, with a boy's frank voice, with a load of fully 75 to 80 pounds. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, can I ask Angus to come in now at this stage, please? Uh, sure, it's Sean. Good morning, and um, I'd like to echo Laura's um, thanks to all my friends in Brazil and to Stephen for uh, agreeing to be the voice of Casement and to Patrick and Aurelio who have really made this film possible. Uh, I just want to make a few basic comments and sketch in a bit of context to these readings. Um, I think in that first reading, which was a little bit broken up, but what Casement was trying to do was to essentially recognize the importance of both uh, protecting and preserving the environment. And I think in this sense, Casement should be recognized as a proto-environmentalist. Uh, throughout his writings on both the Congo and the Amazon, you see him endlessly reference uh, the natural world around him. Uh, he's a very keen uh, botanist. He, he, in some ways, emerges out of that uh, particular, uh, I suppose, imperial tradition. And in that sense, he's a very contemporary voice. He really does see the need for trees to be planted. And at the end of that, or in the, midway through that reading of, of Stevens, um, Casement says, uh, that it really should be the duty of every person to plant more trees. And he refers to a Japanese uh, proverb. And as I was helping to put these readings together, I thought that should be actually something that all um, Irish school children perhaps should do on St. Patrick's Day. We know that we need to plant more trees and uh, no better day to do that than on St. Patrick's Day. Um, but en enough on the environment. I, I want to also sketch in some of the context of Casement's investigations in the Congo and in the Amazon region of South America. And this was really as a consequence of the extractive industry uh, for and the, and the huge market demand for latex rubber that um, really changed how the world operated in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And from about 1850 to 1910, uh, most rubber was extracted directly from the forests of the Congo and the Amazon. And this obviously required, it was very laborious work and it required a lot of uh, feet on the ground to actually uh, go about the daily and painstaking work of extracting rubber, which required making an incision in trees and rubber bearing plants and tapping the rubber and then turning those uh, small cups of rubber into bales and then exporting those bales of crude rubber to the big centers of industry, Liverpool, Antwerp and New York. And by the 1880s, the demand for rubber had increased largely as a result of the invention of the pneumatic tire. And in the following decade, in the 1890s, because of electrification, and rubber became the product at the very center of the next generation of industrial design. And what the kind of imperial powers that were at that time recognized is that the world was going to need more and more rubber in order to make the industrial uh, machine move forward. 
and there began the plantation of Hevea brasiliensis, the most productive of all the rubber trees in Southeast Asia. But there was a period of about 15 years from about 1895 to 1910 when the demand for rubber outstripped supply and it saw this very rapid and very violent opening up of the interiors of both the Congo and the Amazon. And Roger Casement, who was working as an official for the British Foreign Office, was given the task of essentially compiling an official investigation into both of those extensive crimes against humanity. And the first report he produced in 1904 led to the setting up of the Congo Reform Association, which he did with E.D. Morell, the Quaker journalist, and the Irish historian Alice Stopford Green, and um, among others. And then in 1910, he was sent to the Amazon whilst he at that time was serving as British Consul General in Brazil uh, to undertake an investigation of what was happening on the northwest frontier uh, bordering Peru, Colombia and Brazil. And he returned at the end of that year uh, with essentially a dossier of information. That three period of his investigation is the story that I published back in uh, 1997, the Amazon Journal of Education, and which Aurelio uh, has turned to a form that has also been uh, in the uh, Spanish and a Portuguese translation, as soon to be an Italian translation. The importance of Aurelio's film is that what he finally has achieved is to make that story remarkably successful. We can now see how important Casement's investigation was. And that he is very, actually eternally grateful for Aurel, Patrick, and the whole team behind the making of this film. Um, so it gives some extent, uh, some idea of the, the kind of context of Casement's voyage and, and the importance of it. I should briefly say that my own, my own contact with our began back in the early 18, uh, sorry, 1990s when I attended the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And I, um, that I um, just very interested in the history of the Amazon. And I became, uh, I it's to interrupt my microphone is flashing. Is everybody hearing me okay? Can you put some up? And, Angus, I think that there is a problem with the uh, internet, so uh, we are listening to you a bit cut. But uh, let's try. Yeah, I might I screen that, shall I? Let's see, that's better. Um, anyway, just to. Yes, much better. Thank it's you. It's better. Um, so just to continue there, the, in, in 1900 and um, in, in 1990, I, I uh, met up with Aurelio largely as a result of a film he'd made called Arvore de Fortuna, The Fortune's Tree, which was a very long and, and impressive documentary on the political economy of rubber. And in that, it's about a three hour film, I think. And, and in, 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 in the course of that film, he makes a, a brief sort of two minute reference to Casement's investigation, where he says that Casement was sent by the British Foreign Office to bring an end to the um, Amazon extractive rubber industry. And what interests me there was that this, to some extent, conflicted with my own understanding of that story in the sense that um, I had a very strong view, largely based upon my reading of the secondary material, that actually Casement's voyage was all about essentially investigating human rights abuses. And of course, what I had encountered there was a kind of clash of histories that the casement is remembered in different ways in a whole number of different countries. So he's a figure in history in Brazil, in Colombia, in Peru, in Ireland, in, and in Britain. And in each of those national historical contexts, he becomes a different person. And this in a way has made his own commemoration and commemorating very, uh, very difficult to 
uh, in a way to, to make sense of because there have been in, 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 so, in, in different ways so many conflicting versions as to who casement actually was. So is everybody hearing me still? I hope uh, I'm still getting flashing lights on my screen. Good. Um, so I suppose that said, I, I was just meant to speak for five or seven minutes and I've got more to say after uh, Stephen's next reading. So maybe we should um, get Stephen to do the next reading if that's okay. Unless Sean, sorry, was that, am I uh, missing out? Oh no, sorry, Sean, you were going to say, sorry, you were next to speak. No, th thank you very much, Angus. And, um, and we had a little issue with your, your sound. I could pick up most of it, but it, it became much clearer. Um, I, I suppose, you know, just building on everything that's been said, interpretation is very, very challenging. And, you know, this is a Brazilian production that uh, really Owen Patrick you know, they want to bring to a global audience. And this is why, Stephen, you produced a narration. But um, I'm just thinking, you know, be, while we listen to you, that, that you received all that raw footage and then the pieces of the diary. And everybody that has watched this with me, um, and this includes some colleagues, ambassadors, it includes Susie Casement, who's a grand niece of Rogers and happens to be living here in Brazil. Everybody has been, you know, stunned, I think is the, the only word I can use. And there's been silence at the end of the credits, which is often um, the, the ultimate um, credit, I think, for, for something that really moves you. But, you know, I don't know if you'd like to give us a little bit of a personal impression as to the challenge of interpreting this text against such, um, such challenging material. Thank you. Well, um, of course, the first thing you think is what did Casement uh, naturalistically sound like? And no one knows because there are no records. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. You can't hear, you know, it's the same when I, when I played Oscar Wilde, you know, you cannot find out what Oscar Wilde sounded like. So you just, the one thing is you can't be criticised for getting it wrong because nobody knows what what it was actually like. Um, but with with well, both of them, their character is um, apparent in their writing, and I think that of course, Casement uh, Casement's provenance was from the north of Ireland, and he was um, which I share with him. But then um, he was a member of the diplomatic service, and therefore he had a he must have had a, a a great command of, in order to become um, a, a, a leader in that world, he had to be able to present himself very, very well. So I, I just, um, but the main thing about it is the character of his writing and his uh, empathy and his enormous sadness at the way these beautiful people were being destroyed and his ability to reflect back on what happened to the indigenous Irish people um, in Tudor times and, and since. And, uh, so, and, that, and in that he questioned his own uh, service of the British government and, and what he should do. And I always knew more about his uh, activities uh, for Irish independence and it's really down to Angus and other people that I uh, investigated all the stuff in the Congo and uh, Brasilia and I'd, um, he's a great hero and you just try and acknowledge that without taking any credit for it. That's it Sean. Go on. Oh, thank you very much for that, Stephen. Maybe you'll give us the next reading, um, please. Can you hear me? You get, you hear me? Yeah. Um, in this next passage, Casement uses the term crime against humanity to describe what he is witnessing. 
He also compares the situation in the Putumayo region of the Amazon to what he witnessed in the Congo. The, the thing, this thing we find here is carrion, a pestilence, a crime against humanity. And the man who defends it is consciously or unconsciously putting himself on the side of the lowest scale of humanity and propagating a moral disease that religion and conscious, conscience and all that is upright in us should uncompromisingly denounce. This Putumayo slavery is indeed, as Hardenberg said, and as I laughed at when I read it a year ago in truth, a bigger crime than that of the Congo, although committed on a far smaller stage and affecting only a few thousands of human beings, whereas the other affected millions. The other was slavery under law with judges, army, police and officers, often men of birth and breeding, carrying out an iniquitous system invested with monarchical authority and in some sense directed to public or so-called public ends. It was bad, exceedingly bad. And with all its so-called safeguards, it has been condemned and is in process, thank God, of passing or being swept away. But this thing I find here is slavery without law, where the slavers are personally cowardly ruffians, jailbirds, and there is not authority within 1,200 miles and no means of punishing any offence, however vile. Sometimes Congolese justice intervened and an extra red-handed ruffian was sentenced. But here there is no jail, no judge, no law. Every chief of section is judge and law in one, and every section itself is only a big jail with the Indians on the treadmill and the criminals as the jailers. The commission's carriers are over 40 Atenas Indians, many of them boys. Several are literally skeletons. I never saw anything much thinner than four boys of from 15 to 20. We photographed them. One had dreadful sores as well, and the back of one had been flogged raw. It was heart rendering. God help them. I give orders to Seely to give all the tins of meat I had left to them. Poor creatures. Tizon had a good meal of rice and beans and sardines cooked for them too. And he says they shall have another in the morning before they return to Atenas. We found lots of the forest trees with berries pulled down and lying across the track. O'Donnell says this was done by Norman's starving carriers. Here is the literal illustration of what the barbarians have said to me, that when on the march, the Indians live on seed, sir. Here were the very seeds. I found two varieties of trees had been dragged down, often the path blocked by the fallen trunks and the branches torn away. Tizon was saying just what I did all the way, that it was time this commission of ours had come, if indeed it is not far too late. I feel quite hopeless in heart, as I do not think any effective and humane control can be set up. Effort to establish it will no doubt be made, and Tizon will do all one man can do. But he is the only honest Peruvian I have met, except the prefect. One, one man cannot cleanse this place, and the English company is only English in name. Thank you, thank you very much, Stephen. I mean, those are very powerful words, um, and they give us a truth that you know cannot be denied. We're very fortunate that Casement was such a prolific writer, and um, and left us with with so many honest honest and unembellished uh, thoughts on and i suppose maybe if i can turn to you angus because you edited this diary but you know just get a reflection on your own interpretation of uh, the documentary and how this diary works with the with both the original images of the time and a uh, the wonderful black and white photo photography that is used to, to bring this story to life in the present day. Thanks. 
Uh, sure, Sean. Um, <clears throat> well, I, 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 the period of rubber from the 1890s through to the beginning of, uh, of the First World War coincides with the emergence of photography uh, into mass market publishing. So, and uh, so, so, so what you have uh, during that period, there are a lot of books about South America and in particular the Amazon, which to some extent is giving people some sort of understanding of the region and why it's important. And a lot of them are backed up with photographs. And Casement himself goes in to the Amazon in his two voyages uh, up the river in 1910 and 11 with the camera and he takes photographs and he uses those photographs to supplement his written evidence as to what is happening. Uh, we were fortunate um, about a decade ago when the historian Jordan Goodman wrote a book on Casement's Amazon voyages called The Devil and Mr. Casement. Uh, and during his researches in the Library of Congress, uh, Jordan came across uh, the album of photographs that Casement uh, compiled for his investigation. Uh, the copy in the British Foreign Office archive hadn't um, uh, survived. Um, what those images showed us was that Casement used the camera uh, in the Pool de Mayo, and he wasn't a great photographer, and he was suffering very much from eye problems um, when he made that investigation in 1910. But what he tried to do with the camera was to, in, in a way, capture both the sense of agency and resilience and I suppose stoicism uh, within the Indians uh, as they faced up to this uh, regime of terror. And though that body of photographs differs uh, markedly from the photographs uh, from the uh, Congo investigation, which he of course didn't take, they were mainly taken by evangelical um, missionaries who had settled uh, in the Congo in the late 19th century. But the photographs that to some extent gave such momentum to the Congo campaign were very graphic and disturbing. They showed amputated limbs and were, were pictures of really deep and, and to some extent dark suffering. Um, whereas Casement's images, some of them did expose the appalling crimes that were being committed by the regime in the Amazon, but his photographs were also uh, an effort to capture a different type of sentiment, uh, a different type of, um, in a way, affection. And I think that is important. And again, what Aurelio has done is he's managed to draw the enormous body of photographic and cinematic archive footage together into his film. I mean, the other great irony of this story is Julio Cesar Arana, who was the essentially the, the kind of devil within this story, who was the owner of the Peruvian Amazon company that was committing these um, crimes against humanity. In about 1913, he paid for a young uh, and ambitious photographer and cinematographer to go to Paris to study filmmaking. And the earliest film made on the Amazon was of the atrocities that Casement was investigating. And that, I, I, again, has been part of the narrative that um, Aurelio has drawn into this, uh, in, into his film. So I think on another level, um, Secrets of Pudamayo is as much a beautiful piece of filmmaking and as you say a masterpiece it is also an archive of um, photographic evidence of that atrocity I mean I would I, I don't know if you w want me to continue there Sean but um, I think before I, I can see we've only got a few minutes left and there are a couple of last comments I, I wouldn't mind making um, the, the reading that uh, Stephen is going to finish on is essentially, I think, quite a mystical moment uh, uh, in Casement's investigation where he speaks very explicitly about uh, a voice 
that spoke to him out of the night. And I think, again, one of the important things to recognize about Casement is that he almost um, was a figure that belongs not merely to his age, but to every age. There's a very powerful line of, uh, um, of, a, of a kind of obituary written by Eva Gore Booth, the Countess Markovitz's sister. Uh, she wrote in the Catholic Bulletin in 1918, an obituary of Casement. And in that obituary, she said the following. She said about him, the long years of selfless devotion and affectionate friendship had brought him into harmony with the unseen purposes of the universe and very near to the divine meaning of human life. And I think in this last passage that Stephen is going to read, you're, you get that sense of casement connecting to the unseen purposes of the universe. Um, and I think as it's St. Patrick's Day, that's a very uh, apt thing to, uh, for us to think about. Um, and just one final point, I would like to, unfortunately I haven't got my camera switched on because uh, of the issues we're having, but um, I would like to make reference to Mariana Bolfarini's book, Between Angels and Demons, um, the uh, study that she produced a couple of years ago on casements, um, in a way, his, his place within the literary imagination. And I, I would really like to congratulate Mariana, which I haven't been able to uh, because my visits to Brazil have been too short and um, we all lead such busy times. But I would like to say that I think Mariana's um, in of trauma theory into our understanding of casement is one of the most important interventions that has been made in casement studies um, over the last century, quite simply. Uh, it certainly changed how I began to read casement. And I think one of the, and I, I'm gonna finish on this point, is that I think we are still trying to process the trauma around casement. And I think um, uh, Ambassador Hoy uh, explains that very well in, in his own anecdotes about how casement is treated in, uh, you know, ambassadorial circles in sub-Saharan Africa and so forth. But um, I think that there is this sort of almost transgenerational trauma that comes through, that there are so many different casements in so many different historic um, contexts. And I think what understanding um, Mariana's book allows us to do is to actually see how we are still in a process of, um, of, of, of dealing with the trauma that Coastment exposed in terms of his uh, investigations in the Congo and the Putumayo, the desperate crimes against humanity that still echo and reverberate in our own day, and indeed in the confusion as to who Casement actually was that can be felt from the very highest levels of academia down to uh, basic grassroots levels of the understanding of a very remarkable man. But on that, I want to pass over to uh, Sean and um, Stephen and thank everybody for listening. And, th and thank you very much, Angus. This to have, to have one hour on Roger Casement is always ambitious because we could talk for hours and hopefully we will have another opportunity to do that uh, when we move beyond COVID. But just before um, Stephen closes uh, the session today with his reading, I just want to share that um, you know this embassy maintains a focus on the indigenous people in the Amazon region and I've been to Manaus twice, I've been to Belen de Parra twice and um, just over a month ago we were able to provide a grant of 100,000 euro to the Brazilian Red Cross to help support indigenous people after the health uh, system collapsed in Manaus and um, I think there is that we are still influenced very much by the work of Roger Casement here. So, um, Stephen, can I ask you maybe to close us off uh, with your final <coughs> reading and yes. any other comments you'd like to make and to thank everybody once again. Okay. Um, 
this final passage describes Kesson seeing a lunar rainbow, which he takes as a sign, or as he puts it, out of the night a voice speaks. Just as this thought raised itself, I looked up from the veranda to the eastern sky and saw, to my amazement, an arc of light across the dark, starless heaven. For a moment, I did not realize what it was. Then I saw it, a lunar rainbow, a perfect arch of light in the sky. The moon was in the west with stars and a clear sky round her in the east, obscure sky and coming rain, and this wondrous white perfect bow spanning dark. I called Fox, Bell, all of them, everyone came. None had ever before seen such a sight. It was about 7.30, as near as could be. And as we looked at the perfect arch curving from forested hill to forested hill, right across the eastern heavens. The rain began to gather over it. It was slowly dissipated, broadening and fading away. We watched it for nearly 10 minutes. I take it to be a good omen, an omen of peace and an augury of good that God is still there, looking down on the sins and crimes of the children and men, hating the sin and loving the sinner. He will come yet to these poor beings and out of the night a voice speaks. I shall not sell the great question of the Indians and their hopes of freedom for this mess of pottage for the handful of black men. These shall get their rights freely granted and I shall not be the agent of silence but I hope of the voice for freedom. Shin A. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Stephen. And thank you, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful session enlightening, uh, listening to um, all the writings and, and your voices. Stephen, thank you very much. And all your explanations, uh, um, Angus, that uh, you have all that knowledge to contextualize this to our, to our audience. And I would like to um, uh, finish this session um, referring to the very beginning of uh, Sean, uh, Sean's talk uh, and opening remarks in, in trying to show you the, the, the pictures that he mentioned and at the same time to uh, hear from, from you, Sean, uh, how valuable these pictures are. So I will try to, um, to show it now. Um, and then uh, we can, it doesn't matter about the, the little delay that we have for the next uh, session, but everything has to do with Roger Casement and it's good to uh, share with you more comments coming out from this. Okay, this is, uh, this is one of the maps that uh, Roger uh, produced of uh, in Cross Rivers, which is where Calabar is, and it would have, uh, it, you know, this is ju just a detail of it. I think in the next picture, uh, this is, sorry, the next one, this is during the launch when we framed these maps and they're now on permanent exhibit in Calabar in Nigeria. And um, these, these maps are available from the British archives. This is Father Kevin O'Hara. Um, who, like yourself, Monira, um, has uh, been nominated for Distinguished Persons Award by our president, and he, he will receive uh, this honour uh, once uh, we're allowed to do this um, again. And it's for his work on human rights. And I presented this picture of uh, to Father Kevin, and he will hang it in the St. Patrick's Missionaries uh, new um, centre that they're building in Calabar.
And then I think there's one more picture. This one, these water tanks were built uh, around the time the casement was in Calabar. And local stories have it, they're known as the casement tanks because they were the first public water supply ever built in the town and they were the initiative of Roger Casement. I have not been able to verify that uh, they're no longer working. But I think it's very true to the character of Roger Casement that in a small coastal town like Calabar, where there was clean water supplied for the uh, foreign officers who worked there, that he would go out and, and try and build something for local people. So whether it's true or not, I think it's totally possible that it's true. And um, maybe it's just a very nice image to leave today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sean. I think it's interesting um, to, to see um, these pictures because they are also historical. <laughs> and um, I do not know if uh, Angus would like to comment about this a bit more or in, um, and then uh, Stephen would like to tell us a bit about Field Day uh, that um, all your, your work there just to uh, end our session. Feel free to do that. Uh, oh, Laura, thank you. They were very interesting photographs. Um, and I remember I wrote, uh, years ago actually, I wrote an article on those maps um, for History Island. And uh, it's great to see that they were the subsequently used uh, as a form of sort of gifting. Um, within diplomatic circles. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose just to end, I'd like to make reference to uh, President Michael D. Higgins' uh, uh, Reflections 100 or Makhnov 100, which are his, um, his sort of series of lectures that are trying to, to some extent, uh, break with some of the, the, the kind of um, the, the blockages within Irish history. And I suppose that also might make us think as to how Field Day 40 odd years ago managed to do exactly that with um, their own uh, creative interventions. But I am still of the belief, despite the fact that very few um, historians in particular are prepared to, in, in Ireland are prepared to engage with Casement, that he is a critical figure in understanding um, a very important moment, crossroads, if you like, in uh, British-Irish relations and in Ireland's own relationship to empire. I don't think if you, if you don't understand Casement to some extent or make an effort to understand what he's doing in terms of challenging the uh, power structures of empire, then I think you miss a very important uh, intervention or chapter within that long uh, revolutionary moment, if you like, which you could date as far back to the famine and right up to uh, the 1920s. But I think Casement is the or a critical figure and, and the circle of people who um, worked with him uh, to challenge some of the structures of empire in that period. And I think that the, the writing, uh, writing them out of Irish history as, as, as has happened, uh, is um, is a mistake because I think through understanding them you get a much better um, recognition of the kind of complexity of the historical um, divisions within this country. So, and and in Britain indeed. So, um, I, I think the more we speak about Casement and the more we try and understand him, the better it is. Thank you. Thank you, um, Angus. And I do not know, Stephen, if you would like to mention something about uh, the famous uh, context of the field day that you have founded. Well, um, you know, it started in 1980 um, when the troubles were at their height. And um, it was just an instinct on the part of some artists, Brian Friel, Seamus Heaney, uh, Seamus Dean, particularly Seamus Dean. And um, we, uh, 
we just try to look beyond the futility of the sectarian struggle. Um, and uh, we got into trouble as well, you know, because um, uh, everybody from the eastern part of Ireland thought we were um, ridiculous to be doing something in Derry. And, um, but the people in Derry didn't think it was ridiculous and people there, uh, in fact, the audience in any art, the audience is the most significant element, it seems to me. And that um, uh, mostly theatre doesn't worry too much as long as they're paying the money. But we, I used to get stopped by people who said they'd never been in a theatre before they saw Field Day and they were uh, blown away because um, they, they got it. They got what we were talking about and it was what they wanted to uh, listen to. Uh, and um, I'm not, I, I don't want to make too many claims on it, but I'd say that um, apart from the plays, that the, the anthology of Irish literature edited by Seamus Dean is a lasting and incredibly important uh, piece of publication. And, but it, it got a lot of trouble because everybody said we left everybody out that should have been, you know, and all this. But if you look at it, that's, and we had wonderful pamphlets with Edward Said. Edward Said actually said, um, I wish the Palestinians had a field day to speak for them. Um, you know, and uh, I wish they did too, because they're not getting a very good deal. You know. Anyway, that's a little bit. Thank uh, you, Lara, thank so much. You. For, yes, uh, thank you, this. thank you for, <laughs> thank you for for giving us this kind of context. That's very important. We, from the literary field, we follow Field Day from from the very first pamphlets, as you just mentioned, till nowadays, and and Shane's yeah. work uh, is really yeah. inspiring and uh, your work too uh, as an actor and as a really uh, a person that uh, has a, a strong voice in in Irish context also in Ireland. Uh, thanks a lot for being thanks. here with us and thanks Angus very much for uh, organizing this brilliant ses session. I think that this is um, a present for the chair of Irish studies uh, and for our Brazilian audience to have this chance uh, to enter into the history of um, uh, of Roger Casement and especially the importance of his presence in Brazil uh, in the history of Brazil. So thanks a lot, and thank you, Sean, for bringing also your uh, all your experience and and life in 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 Africa in Calibar and and bringing all these photographs that are really very important. Thanks a lot to you all and we will continue now with the round table with Aurelio Michiles and all his team. Uh, we are going to switch into Portuguese um, because uh, I think uh, it's important to reach also our audience uh, here in Brazil but perhaps in the future not very far away we are going to uh, have some um, transcriptions of what we are going to do in the next session to share with you, Stephen. And I know that Angus knows Portuguese, but nevertheless, uh, it's good to pass that to our Irish um, audience too. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. So <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye.